Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Theodore Adorno's short essay called On Jazz. And I hate this essay with a burning passion because Adorno's just wrong about jazz, but he's also racist. So I think that it's good to put those out right up front so you know what's going on and you know my perspective on it. And if you're watching this, you will notice I have a guitar and that's because I'll put in some demonstrations to really problematize what Adorno was saying about classical music and about jazz and how he frames them being different, which I don't normally do. If anyone's new here, I don't normally have a guitar uh, and this isn't going to be habitual. So, but before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, uh, like, share, subscribe, you'll see videos I release every week. You can go and check out however many videos I already have up now, like 250 or something that you can go and listen to. If you found this on YouTube, you're gonna be able to find it in podcast form where uh, you know you can just listen to it. Or if you found this in podcast form, you'll be able to find the video on YouTube if you're into that at all. Now, just because I have a guitar and you can physically see it, doesn't mean anyone listening in podcast form is gonna be, you're not gonna be left out. Uh, everything is gonna be hearable to you. If you wanna help me out do all those things, you can also help me out via Patreon or PayPal if you're interested in that at all, but obviously no pressure. And uh, yeah, let's jump into this text here where Adorno is musing on jazz music and whether or not it operates as a liberatory or emancipatory force. So he starts out this essay by saying that jazz music is essentially kind of dance music with modern intonations or with modern flares, which is already problematic in itself, but it sets the tone for how he's going to characterize jazz music not as something that is guided by formal laws that would relate to music theory, but is something that is guided more by a kind of form and one that is committed to a certain form of music, which makes it or implies that it can be easily adopted by anyone if you just adopted the form. And this is really embedded in the idea that it is just a kind of dance as though it's just something that anyone could do if you know you were given a little bit of training and guidance. It's almost like a purely rhythmic function as opposed to being incredibly melodic and having very complicated theoretical undertones that guide the entire uh, process of producing, of composing jazz music. Now for anyone who's listened to jazz, you'd probably know that it is a pretty unpredictable genre. That is, it isn't so neat in its resolution of various notes of various lines. It will instead produce certain melodies that are a little bit jarring at times and difficult to understand and contextualize within the broader framework of the piece. Now, in, in the face of this, Adorno says, well, while it might appear as though jazz music is then a way by which to employ or to explore new territory for music, it is always underwritten by some kind of rigid structure. So in the case of some jazz tunes, there's going to be accompanying rhythm through the drums. There might be accompanying rhythm through other instruments that play various chords repetitively on top of which some player or players are going to be improvising or throwing down lines or blowing into horns, certain lines that are quite complicated, they're fast, and they deviate a lot from that rhythm or from those guiding chords and structure underneath. Now, he says that despite this claim or this illusion of being uh, free, it is still guided by some fundamental logics of musical composition. That is, the notes that are played on top of any underlying chords, any underlying patterns, are going to be tethered to those patterns in some way or other. And he says that it is in the interest of jazz musicians to try and erase that rigidity, that underlying structure, by being as complicated, by being as fast by being as jarring as possible with the melodies over top of it, which is just a way for him, or at least as he identifies, to provide jazz a kind of veneer of 
individual possibility that escapes certain rigid structures. Now, what makes Adorno particularly suspicious about jazz is just how well commodified it is and how well marketable it is, which reveals to him that despite its somewhat rhizomatic veneer or how it is so complicated, how it is so unpredictable, it still confirms and affirms and it is quite suitable for a certain marketability with a certain capitalist economy, which evacuates it of its potential as a liberatory musical medium. Now he says that it isn't totally surprising that jazz is taken up by all echelons of class society. Now, I think that most of us would probably know jazz in its origina original form was by and large a black musical genre emerging in the Southern United States and in really its roots in Africa and in uh, Central America where black artists were producing music that would blossom into jazz. He says that it is a little bit suspicious that it could be so easily taken up then by the bourgeois, by the middle class, by lower class people, which signals to him that it has a certain function in disappearing or blurring the lines between classes. So suddenly you would have lower class people partaking in this music that would serve as a means to present a false sense of liberation, according to Adorno. Then you would have the upper classes who would be using jazz to signal a kind of taste or style that they, you know, that they had um, a certain air of haute culture about them that would give them this kind of upper status. And so what we see here is an ad adaptation of jazz music to all of these different fields that keeps class structure intact. And so it is for that reason he says that it does not present any kind of liberatory function per se. It is instead, and this is where the problematic stuff certainly begins, this is instead a way by which the bourgeois can naturalize by listening to what he calls more primitive type music, having its roots in more primitive culture, to naturalize their superior position within certain class composition of society. Which leads him to write that the more democratic jazz becomes, the worse it gets. Now he says that at the level of theory, at the level of the understanding of the music, he says that it is quite mysterious as to how jazz is produced and how it becomes popular, how a jazz tune might become a hit. And he says that if a jazz hit or a jazz song becomes a hit, people won't know why it became a hit. They won't actually be able to say what about it made it a hit, which reveals to him that instead of it complying to certain ideas, standard ideas about Western music theory, it is instead the demonstration of a kind of anarchic production of music that doesn't abide by any patterns, any set theory, but is instead just adapts to the code of marketability of these cla of class structure and to certain bourgeois interests, where he says that in an ideal society, there would be a direct correlation between quality and popularity. Whereas in this society, he says that all we have, we don't have this kind of connection, and this is adduced by jazz music, him saying that it doesn't actually have any connection to quality. Uh, it is instead just randomness slapped together into uh, pure marketable forms. And he says because of that, it is not associated with quality, and that reveals the extent to which our society is not an ideal one, because there isn't that relationship between quality and popularity, it is instead a false society, a society founded based upon falseness and a lack of taste. Now, there might be, I think that there is some validity to what he's saying in that musical genres are appropriated by certain classes for, for their own interests, extracted from their point of origin in order to be uh, rendered marketable, to be exploited essentially. And there is, I think, something really to be said about that. However, Adorno doesn't stop there. He says that if we really look at jazz in itself, it corresponds to a lower level of society, just because he hears it as being randomness. He hears it as not complying to any codes or structures. It is just 
the demonstration of a lack of knowledge turned into music. And he equates its producers with primitiveness because of this lack of sophistication. And he says that it is really a simple genre. It is, its musical composition for him is facile. It is simple. And this is where I want to take a minute and to compare just briefly um, a very standard classical piece of music by Bach and one by Dave Brubeck, a jazz piece by Dave Brubeck. And the point that I want to make here is not that either Dave Brubeck or Bach are superior, but that they are both committed to a theoretical domain that is just abides by its own codes and how neither is really random or neither is totally structured. Instead, they are abiding by a certain theoretical tradition that Adorno is just not aware of, which is ironic because he is very intelligent when it comes to music theory. He knows a lot about it, but he's essentially a victim to his own knowledge. He is a victim to his commitment to one form of musical theory related to the Western musical tradition, which mostly sets the stage for classical music as we know it through the music of Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, you know, whoever you would fit into that category. Now this is taken from Bach's Partita number no. three in E major, which is a tune you might recognize, you might not recognize, but it is really a, a, a profoundly beautiful piece. And I just want to play a few, a few of the first bars for you here, and then I want to break it down really quickly to show you how structured it really is, yet how beautiful it is and how, uh, how much is taken out of its incredibly simple and limited structure. And it goes like this, at least the first few bars. <laughs> Now that is the first few bars of this piece, and it's really a beautiful piece of music. And it is in the key of E. And the key of E is comprised of these notes. It goes E, F sharp, G sharp, A, B, D flat, E flat, E, or D sharp, E. Now, everything I just played here uses those eight notes, or those seven notes in order to make up that beautiful composition here. Now let's just take the first couple of bars of that song or that piece that go like this. What that is essentially is the breakdown of that E major scale. It starts with an E and then it goes E, D sharp, E, so the 8 to the 7 to the 8, to the 5 to the 3, to the 1 to the 2, back to the 7. Now what this tells us is that there is a lot that can be taken out of this very boring major scale. That can be turned into this. And then extended for the whole piece that I've just played or the first uh, many bars. Now you may not hear it there, and I'm not gonna break it all down, but all of those notes belong to that E major scale that corresponds to the E chord. So if I played this, it really works well together. Now by contrast, if I were to play 
Dave Brubeck's Take 5, which I hope I don't get copyrighted for, it's going to sound like this. And you might, you might recognize it. It starts out with a very cool little uh, rhythmic breakdown. Now this, this song is essentially just an E flat minor. That's the note you're going to be hearing, or this is the kind of timbre of the song with these two bass notes thrown in and this kind of underwrites the majority of the, the piece. And you know, there are other chords thrown in there, like a B, a B minor, I believe, and, and including other ones, but it's fairly simple. Now an E flat minor is going to include these notes. It's gonna be E flat, F, G flat, A flat, B flat, C flat, D flat, and then finally E flat. So the only natural note in there is an F. The rest are all flats. So E flat, F, G flat, A flat, B flat, uh, C flat, D flat, and E flat. Now, as the song progresses or as the piece progresses, the first few bars of the melody go like this. And you might recognize it here. And then it goes into this really cool little part. It goes like that. Now, if you hear that over this chord, it kind of sounds nice. It, it works together. However, between these two parts, this one here, and the one I played earlier, we're gonna find a note that actually falls outside of that scale, outside of the E flat minor scale, which I mentioned was E flat, F, G flat, A flat, B flat, C flat, D flat, and E flat. Now in this, we're gonna find this very interesting A note, which doesn't belong to that scale. And this A note falls outside of that scale. And it's a very cool sound. And if you were to throw it in the scale, it would make sense. Because the scale, remember, goes like this. Now, if I were to add that, it could sound something like. It works, like it really, it fits within that arrangement, but it is outside of the scale. So what Brubeck has done there, he's added a note that has effectively colored the song, colored the piece in a very interesting way. But it's important to note that this chord or this note is not gonna be emphasized in the same way. And if you really hear how it should be played, it's gonna sound a little bit dim compared to the other notes. So the emphasis is gonna be placed on the note that comes before it and the note after it. It's just working as a stepping stone to that next note, that B flat. Because if you were to play it all at the same kind of level, it would sound a little weird. It might sound like this. And that doesn't sound very jazzy. It sounds kind of dry and, and boring as opposed to... Whereas this is kind of resolving itself or arriving at this B flat note that actually belongs to the scale in a much more satisfying way where that would be lost if all the notes were just played with the same kind of gusto. Now, the point of this is to show that there are certain possibilities afforded by kind of standard jazz rhythm and jazz theory that classical music doesn't always use, and it's kind of foreign to classical uh, music theory, but in any case, it reveals something very cool that's possible with this kind of music. And this extends much further than Dave Brubeck. Of course, it will extend to so many other jazz musicians, Miles Davis, Grant Green, Charlie Parker, who are, and especially Charlie Parker, who's, um, who's gonna use notes that fall really far outside of the standard seven note scale. 
in order to give it a certain color and to permit him to be playing very complicated lines that will keep the emphasis on certain beats by incorporating these kind of in-between notes. And it will give it that kind of jazzy feel. So jazz is not simply reducible to a kind of form. It very much complies to theoretical structures and to theoretical ideas. And it really reveals that Adorno has no idea what he was really talking about, where when he heard jazz music, all he heard was noise, which reveals the extent to which his ear was really underdeveloped and how he didn't grasp the ways in which all of those incredibly complicated lines that were played over the rhythm corresponded to those chords in ways that were completely alien to him. And it afforded new possibilities. So when you were to play, so with jazz music, one of the really interesting things that's afforded by it is that it mutates the very meaning of the rhythm that is played underneath. Whereas if you had a classical piece where you'd have certain uh, percussive rhythms, uh, you know, alongside other more uh, rhythmic instruments that accompany a melody, there's going to be a very smooth affinity a lot of the time between the two. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's fantastic. But with jazz music, what is going to happen is that the melody is often going to depart from that rhythm. It is going to find ways to transform what that underwritten, what the underlying rhythm and essentially the music means. So you might be using notes that fall outside of the chord, fall outside of the scale, but nevertheless point to a new possibility for that very scale, mutating its possibility and affording new potential. Now with this being said, jazz in itself is not a kind of magically emancipatory musical medium. And here Adorno simply confuses what music can be in itself to how it is appropriated. Now, jazz music being appropriated by mass marketing techniques, by bourgeois culture, it says nothing about jazz. It says everything about that culture that appropriates it. And he associates, he goes so far as to associate jazz with a kind of fascistic type of music because just because it doesn't comply to standard music theory for him reveals the extent to which the masses can be duped into believing anything into submitting to anything, even if it can't be justified. Whereas we know now, and people knew at the time, just you know, not among his friends or himself because he was uneducated about it, it did comply to certain uh, theoretical traditions and it was incredibly complicated. Despite that, he believed that it wasn't, it didn't have any codes, it didn't have any structure. And so therefore anyone who bought into it is simply a prime victim or or as prime candidate for fascism. They can just be duped by any kind of untruth and then submit to a mass, which is kind of the one of the prerequisites for fascism, really. And he says that jazz music, and it's funny, he says jazz music was enjoyed by Mussolini. And he says that it is particularly suited for military marches, which makes my me very curious. He, he obviously has never heard of Wagner uh, or any other classical music that was enjoyed by the aristocracy and then bourgeois culture all through all, all classes essentially. For some reason, he doesn't consider classical music, specifically he thinks about Beethoven, as lending itself to that oppressive culture. It instead exists outside of it. It is what is emancipatory, even though the entire history of this music is absolutely connected to these oppressive institutions, these oppressive class structures. Now I wanna read one of the last quotes I took out of this piece uh, because it's, it's funny and you could just tolerate my, um, my reciting to you, where he says that in contrast to something like Beethoven or someone like Beethoven, jazz music that makes a lot of use of syncopation, now syncopation is when uh, you play a note before the beat and that creates a kind of tension with the rhythm and with the, the melody. He says that jazz is not the expression of an accumulated subjective force which directed itself against authority until it has produced a new law out of itself. It is purposeless, unlike Beethoven, which is his example, which is just totally absurd. 
And it's incredibly problematic, his implicit association of jazz music with a kind of primitiveness, really looking at it as a, a form instead of a being comprised of melody, instead of corresponding to theory, instead of being incredibly complicated. Like Miles Davis, someone who, a uh, very profoundly uh, talented musician who uh, composed the, the piece So What, which sounds like... Uh, which you might recognize. Incredibly talented musician was taking music theory courses, was essentially sneaking into music theory courses because at the time, obviously, he didn't have the means to actually enter them. So many of these early jazz musicians in the early 20th century didn't have the means to access, you know, these higher upper echelons of music theory that Adorno holds so dear, because he Adorno really loves the aristocracy. Adorno loves taste as it is, is associated with the upper classes, with the bourgeois, as much as he would hate to admit it. He loves it. He loves that stuff. Now, many of these early musicians didn't actually have that ability to access that uh, terrain, which is all the more impressive that they were able to come up with such complicated theoretical arrangements that only like many decades later, people in, uh, in these gatekeeping ivory tower institutions began to recognize the actual com complexity of these arrangements and to understand that they aren't just random musical progressions that are just guided by a certain form. They are incredibly complicated. And yeah, that's, I hope I took a risk, you know, playing guitar. Uh, if, if you like that, I won't do it again. <laughs> I hope you liked it. If there's anything I got, I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it or anything I excluded, I'd love to hear about it. Um, any critiques on my guitar playing? I know my timing was a little off, but you know, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not practicing, but and anyways, uh, yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, who knows they might get a kick out of it, and uh, yeah, catch you next time, take care.